I'm Anthony from The Hiding. Uh, next to me is Chris and further on is Ryan. Uh, today we're just going to have a little bit of a talk about our, our history, what we've been up to, what's coming up and um, a few funny stories about the band as well. So we've been through a few different lineup changes. The, the Hiding has existed quite a while ago. It used to be a, a rock band called Scarlet Blue and from there we did a lot of touring around Australia. We also toured the US a couple of times under that lineup. That was very exciting, it was very rock, it was um, very uh, guitar driven, very hard drumming driven and a lot of, a lot of keyboards. Um, the beauty about that was is we got to really tour and become tight as a unit. The first producer we had was a guy from the 80s who'd done like Billy Idol and uh, I think he uh, did some stuff with the Beatles off memory and but you know that, that created a sound that was consistent to a rock act of that genre and then when we got you know Jimmy Marutis on board and he really reinvented us to a current contemporary sound that was more true to us yeah, and we right. actually wrote better that way. Yeah we did a lot on songwriting, yeah. a lot of lectures with Pat Patterson and so we focused in a lot on telling more of a story as opposed to being more of an instrumental rock. Yeah. The vocals on top kind of came yeah. laid the other way. Yeah, because it used to be like heavy riffs. Yeah, with the and lyrics come second a bit. Came second, and now it's the lyric first. We have some good lyrics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good lyrics. People still like the lyrics. They're a bit cheesy and yeah. a bit wrong, but yeah, you know, it was fun. <laughs> and then, and then came across the new lineup of the Hiding, which sort of came about after all that touring. We showcased at CMJ New York. We did college radio. Um, radio plugging that you know had some pretty successful radio campaigns. That was all good, and the, and the beauty about that was we really got to discover what people liked, and we also got to discover what we liked playing live. Mm. Um, the only issue with that was touring became quite expensive, and as we were getting a bit older, um, people didn't have the same financial capacity to put into the band. So me and Ryan, when we moved to New York for three months just before Chris joined, we started to look at ways to be able to gig. Uh, across more venues without having to bring as much gear. I mean, you go to LA or you go to New York, you're not just rocking up with a couple of drum snares and a, and a pedal. They give you massive road cases. If you're hiring a keyboard, no, it's yeah. a massive touring Coffin keyboard. Thing, yeah. yeah, so you need big cars, big vans, you need big taxis, you need... Logistically it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Bunch, we we just, tried to carry yeah. some of that stuff on a train, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't happening. Nah, it happen. nah. And <laughs> it was really bad. So like when you look at all of that logistics, we said, what else, how else can we gig yeah. and have the same kind of sound? And that's where we started looking at Ableton Live as a alter alternative option where we still record all the instruments live. Like Ryan plays bass, mm -hmm. I play guitar, we sing, we even got a guest vocalist to kind of dynamically change the sound a bit as a feature. Um, got Chris on keys, and what that's done is, it's elevated the, the the option of gigging at more venues without having to make sure everyone's available. And Chris has been, been pretty big at bringing that influence into the stage. Do you want to add anything to that? No, it's pretty much um, it's moved, I guess. Yeah, like you've said, from that organic feel to like organic meets electronic, and it's just created a new dimension to a live show where we're getting outward influences from everything that we can imagine like any sample becomes relevant anything sort of becomes a bit of an atmosphere in the live set and that just sort of creates a different dimension to the music and it's almost every song we don't know what's coming next in terms of inspiration uh, some highlights we've had over the uh the journey oh oh, oh heaps Touring was, was great. Um, playing, we supported, lucky enough to jump on the bill with Aerosmith, um, Van Halen, Billy Joel. That was a nice, that was an awesome experience in, I was in Sydney. Um, playing with um, 660 at the Forum a couple of times was, was, uh, was amazing. Some of the best nights of my life was with the bands and things I'll never forget. Just even the first night we were in, um, probably the first time we were in LA and we were dressed up in all like our rock stuff and. We rock into this venue that's all like the rainbow, which is known to have all the all the heavies of rock and roll. Lemmy and all that, well, Lemmy was uh, hanging out there and we rocked up these like all enthusiastic Aussie guys wearing all the black stuff in the chains. Thinking and all we'd this, fit in. Yeah, <laughs> those hardcore American rockers sitting there looking at us like, yeah, give you, give you guys a couple of weeks. Um, some of the, um, going back to what you're saying about the equipment, um, Anthony has a an awesome habit of buying something before he even picks up and plays it. <laughs> You've done that several times. You go in a music shop, you see something he likes, and he just buys it without even, even holding it. He goes, yeah, I'll, just, I'll have that. <laughs> and the first time we use a guitar, we'll be on stage. Yeah. Yeah. And he just buys it. Just and buys it. it. But now the equipment we use now, it's completely different. Obviously, we started out using drums, bass, keys, and guitar. 
and now it's like no drums, barely any bass if, if necessary. And well, more so if it's needed. Yeah, like this riffing not at all. And now you've element. got a whole setup going. Yeah, yeah. So it's totally different. I haven't used those guitars in ages. They, they get used on recordings. No, they use it on gigs. Yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> and gigs, recordings, yeah. Gigs yeah, yeah. and recordings. Um, I, I sort of have a hybrid kind of setup of sorts, really. I've got the Juno, um, Roland Juno keyboard, um, which runs all the synth sounds in terms of what I record with some of the stuff I, we do for demoing and stuff, I throw in um, the Prophet, the DSi Prophet as well for more of those atmospheric pad sounds and a bit of the more, um, yeah, more pulsating synths, I guess. Um, as well as that, I do a bit of electronic drumming as well. So I've got the SPDSX drum pad, which has got samples and it's got even certain um, percussive sounds that we use for some covers and for some, um, some of the live set um, as well as that um, vocals I guess mm. yeah just the mic as well but yeah it's a matter of just balancing them on a live set sometimes I'm playing the keys and then I jump straight to the pad and then got to do almost two at once in like the intro song that we've been doing of late it's doing two at once which is sort of multitasking at its best I guess. Oh, I've always been pretty uh, Fender driven I like my Fender bass I like the traditional stuff so um, yeah just a P bass and a um, one I picked up in LA it is a Deluxe precision, so I've got the best of both worlds, really. Yeah. Um, but we've always been lucky when we're recording more. We've always had access to other equipment because not not necessarily our equipment is best for the song. Mm. So you have to outsource the right sounds. So if the drum might not have the right snare, so we, we might have to hire the snare in what's best for the song. Yeah, to get the best. Yeah, out of the this, track. This, that's right. You might not not might not want that strat, so you might use a tally. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And every time we were lucky, most of the touring we did, the, the Australian dollar was amazing at the yeah. time. <laughs> so I've come back with you know three three five Gibson, which you didn't play before I bought. That one I did. We actually spent a bit of time on that one. Remember in the shop, and then I, then it came back in, in pieces, pieces at the airport. Yeah. But um, that one, I, I tried a new model and actually you tried actually to did play. spend all day doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember now. And yeah. then going back and forth negotiating yeah. and all the different places. And then I've got a um, a semi hollow body Fender Telecaster, and I've got the Gibson Fifty Seven reissue, which I bought on in, in the states as well. Um, they're, they're my guitar gear. I was a Vox guy for a, a long time. Before that, I was using the Marshall because it was a heavier, heavier sound. But I found the Vox was a lot more universal, had a m much more dynamic spread as far as the distortion because we're using a lot of ballads yeah. versus heavy, and you just needed a bit of a boost with a bit of bit of gain to it. You didn't need to go too heavy, so that was a great amp for that. Mm. Um, as far as the gear now, I'm using an Ableton Live setup with a push, um, a Motu that allows me to have you know, eight or nine channels sort of out so you, you can mix the bu the bass live, you can mix the drum live, the, the synth, the guitars and backing vocals and just the odd sample. That's all getting put through the, the uh, computer and coming out of the Motu. Stuff. My advice would be just really taking your time with like strategizing each release, make sure there's something behind it in terms of um, not so much financial backing because some of the best releases out nowadays um, are done on a budget and done in a bedroom and they've become some of the biggest hits. For me, if you're younger, like if you're quite quite young, like you're just starting out, maybe even 18, just turned 18 and you're, and you're getting into the live overage scene or even getting into the underage scene, write as much as you can while you don't have um, too many expenses in life, just write as much as you can, get a, a massive catalogue of songs, collaborate with as many artists as you can, because if any of them start to blow up and you've got song content with them, you'll start to elevate as well. My year would be probably be proactive and don't wait for someone else to do it, because they're not. Yeah, you gotta kind of, if you want to, if you want to get a gig with a great band, find the great bands, research who their management is, research who the touring agent is and contact every one of them because yeah. you might have a manager but they probably, they might just do one thing and give up but when it's you and it's your project, it's up to you to make it happen because no one's going to do it for you. So if you want to find us, um, you can catch us on YouTube or our website which is thehidingmusic.com, Facebook, Spotify, SoundCloud, we're on all those avenues um, and a live show. Look us up we're on, on Bands in Town where we're playing and please come see, see us and say hi. Bonfire lights, bonfire nights Come on my life, come on my life